Uh, I, I was turned on to this film, Rebels with a Cause, a number of months ago. I had no idea what it was. Uh, I don't know if I, somebody, oh, uh, yeah. Michael Borstein lent me the, the DVD, which I watched and was blown away by, and immediately decided I would purchase my own copy and decided, well, if I'm gonna have a copy, I'm probably gonna be lending it out all the time, so I better get two. So I ended up buying three copies of the film, and I think I've still got one left, but this is a tremendous film. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to persuade our speakers, the filmmakers, to come and talk to us about the making of the film. Uh, a number of you have already seen it. For you, this will be a real treat. If you have not seen the film, this will also be a treat. You'll, you'll find out what you've got in store. And if you want to see the film, first of all, we'll be uh, manning a table at the uh, end of the presentation where you can buy copies of the DVD. Uh, and since it's holiday season, it might be a great Christmas gift or a Hanukkah gift or whatever. Um, but also, if you want to see the film, it's being shown tomorrow at the uh, Marin, I'm sorry, the Novato City Hall at 6 p.m. I'm told there's no charge. So if you want to just waltz into the City Hall at 922 Macklin in Novato, you can see this film in its entirety. It's about 90 minutes, I think. Uh, that's being presented by the City of Novato and the Marin Conservation League. So let's tell you about the film a little bit. Uh, the Modern History of Marin is a tale of unexpected drama. I wrote this and courage. While planners and developers penciled out a scheme to grow the region's population and ramp up infrastructure and density as far as Point Reyes, others had a different vision in mind. In December today, we are welcoming the award-winning creators of the astonishing Rebels with a Cause, which tells the story of a dedicated band of activists whose vision and tenacity completely changed the county's trajectory decades ago, thereby preserving what we all enjoy today. So we'll have two presenters, the filmmakers. Nancy Kelly, Kelly is a writer, director, producer, working in Marin in documentary and narrative film. Her works have won many awards and have screened around the world. In addition to Rebels with a Cause, she directed a documentary trilogy about the transformative, transformative power of art, Trust, Second Acts and Young Lives, Smitten, and Downside Up. She also directed the acclaimed dramatic feature, Thousand Pieces of Gold, starring Rosalind Chow and Chris Cooper. Her favorite award is Best Feature Film of the Year from the National Cowboys Hall of Fame. <laughs> I want to hear more about that. Kenji Yamamoto has been editing and producing documentaries for over 30 years, winning numerous awards. As part of Kelly plus Yamamoto Productions, he edited and produced the 1991 narrative feature Thousands, Thousand Pieces of Gold, which participated in the Sundance Institute Screenwriting Lab. After premiering at the San Francisco International Film Festival, that film screened at the Deauville Festival of American Film and the International Film Festivals of London, Moscow, Vancouver, and Seattle. He also produced and edited Downside Up, Smitten, Trust, Second Acts in Young Lives, and Rebels with a Cause, and is making his directorial debut with Hacker House, a documentary. So, you've heard enough from me. I'm going to turn this over to our speakers, Nancy and Kenji, and I think the, the format's gonna be a little bit different today. Ordinarily we do, you know, the talking head presentation followed by a, a formal q and I think today they're, they're gonna be opening this up for your comments and questions as they present, so don't be shy, I'm gonna let them uh, lead, lead the charge here and take it away. Hi everybody, how's lunch? Are they treating you well? I'm not Nancy, I'm Kenji. <laughs> like I'm Nancy, and our film is called Rebels with a Cause, and we have a rebel in the house, Doug Ferguson. <laughs> so, <laughs> the man with the funniest line in the whole film, as you will see. Um, so, um, let's see. I want to tell you a little bit about how this film got started. Can everyone, am I loud enough? Can you hear me? Um, so our, what, our partners, um, 
and we made another documentary called Smitten with KRCB, the public television station in Sonoma County. Um, and I was in a meeting with Nancy Dobbs, who's the president and CEO, and she kind of leaned over to me and said, would you be interested in making a documentary about saving the coast? And Kenji and I are not only filmmaking partners, we're married, and what I should have done was say, you know, let me talk to Kenji and get back to you, but I love those open spaces, and so you know where this is going. I just said yes, <laughs> which committed us to 10 years of work. We're still married. <laughs> I think it was about two or three weeks later, there was a little bit of pillow talk, so gentlemen, pay attention to pillow talk. It was actually a, a wonderful journey because um, we thought that we would make this film that would be so easy to make. Here's this wonderful open space in our backyard. How easy can that be? It could be... But once we started to do research, we discovered that there is quite a history in citizen action. People saying this place needs to be saved for everybody. So that was the beginning of our journey and long research in the history of how this county and San Francisco, basically the Bay Area, came to be. Uh, this mixture of, uh, of, of urban, suburban life and nature all around us in every way. So, so um, what you, you probably know a couple of the books that, um, that we used um, when we were researching. Um, one is a, a book by John Hart called um, The Wilderness Next Door, which I read in the early 80s because I used to keep a horse out at Muir Beach and I be out there riding through the marine headlands and see the, the um, skyline of San Francisco and I would think, how is this possible? And then that book came out and I read it and I got a fairly good idea, which is why when Nancy said, are you interested? I was like, yes. And the other book is by Marty Griffin, which many of you know, um, Saving the Marin Sonoma Coast, um, another rebel. So, um, but also I spent a lot of time in the, um, Kent room in the Marin, the central center, um, civic center. the civic center library. Um, library. And do you, how many of you have gone into that room? And yeah, so do you know how hard the chairs are in there? <laughs> and there was a whole bunch of um, interviews that were done, like oral history interviews by the Bancroft Library. And one of them told the story of Clem Miller, um, the um, congressman who was um, inspired to, to really try to make Point Reyes happen. And, um, and there was a very dramatic and um, tragic event in, um, in Clem's life, which you'll see in this clip that we're gonna show you. Um, and when I read that, I just thought, oh, I see how to do this movie. <laughs> and, um, and so that was kind of what launched the first um, three sections, really, of the film. So we're gonna show you the introduction and, um, and the first, I, I always call them chapters, even though that's a literary term. Um, it just made sense to me in the making of it. So here so. we go. <laughs> cities in the world that have such a remarkable landscape near a great urban center like this. Free to use. I mean, you don't have to own a ranch in Northern California to enjoy walking in the wild. How did they 
they do it? Between the 1950s and the 1970s, when California was the nation's fastest growing state and cities were gobbling up nearby forests and fields, ordinary people in the San Francisco Bay Area saved a vast stretch of coastline north of the Golden Gate Bridge for parks and farms. Their efforts fostered a national movement to preserve open spaces near where people live. What happened here is worth sharing because it shows all of the gains happened in incremental baby step ways. Do you know what I mean? They weren't magnificent. You didn't all of a sudden say, here's a hundred thousand acre park. It wasn't like that. It was all incremental. The idea of a national park near an urban center was brand new at that time. A lot of people didn't want it, including the park service. The head of the park service said, we don't want an urban park. But we were able to start the county thinking about these areas being public and permanent and not part of real estate development future. And that took some doing. But nobody thought would prevail at the time. Recall conservationists, which is kind of a dirty word. You were on the next step to a communist. <coughs> and uh, that was true. I think we we're kind of rebels with a cause. The idea we had in the 1960s that's a growing country, so our park system and our wildlife refuge system should grow. And the people, I'm telling you, the people that wanted wilderness, they were very frustrated. I first heard about Point Reyes when I was a congressman from uh, a, a wonderful congressman. His name was Clem Miller. And he bugged everybody. <laughs> and he showed you pictures. And he was a, a freshman congressman, I think, elected in 1958. And he was very persuasive and the right person to take on a big project. Clem was patient. Uh, he was an attractive person. He was smart, a sweet, wonderful man. We're running out of open space in the United States. With an expected population of about 10 million in this area in the next 10 years, we need open space. For this reason, I introduced the Point Reyes bill, Western Marin, to provide open space for our people in this area. Keep land values up. When I first went to work for Clem after the 58 election, uh, he took me on a tour of the district and he stopped at the top of that hill where you first can see Inverness Ridge and Clem said, we're going to save all this, meaning the Port Reyes Peninsula. And that was my number one assignment and it was his priority all the way through. He grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, he saw what had happened to so much of the really prime outdoor areas. He had a very good sense of what the future of this area would be without the park. The 
uh, Rent County Board of Supervisors uh, were four to one for subdivision development out here. Almost all the ranchers uh, out on the peninsula uh, were opposed. We didn't want the park in here. And uh, we, we tried to do everything we could to keep them out. We not only had the Board of Supervisors uh, on, on our side, we also made friends up in Congress. And that was a really a problem. When Clem had his first audience with the chairman of the House Interior Committee, a man named Wayne Aspinall, a curmudgeon, a curmudgeon. Mr. Aspinall asked Clem, does your local government support this? And Clem had to say, not yet. And the chairman said, we don't like to go against local government. Your bill for the National Seashore has a red light. It will go nowhere until you get local government support. So that became a very early objective. But there were formidable local allies, too. Caroline Livermore and the Marine Conservation League have been fighting local battles for parks and better planning since the 1930s, when the opening of the Golden Gate Bridge ended the county's rural isolation. Now, Clem asked the revered Mrs. Livermore to organize support for the seashore. It was the first form of citizen action, really, for the seashore. First of many for the seashore. At the first hearing in Washington, which was held before Mr. Aspinall's committee, Joe Mendoza was the leader of the ranchers who opposed. They were very good witnesses, very good witnesses. I told them the weather was so bad out here in Port Reyes, people didn't want to come out here. <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> I, I was exaggerating a little bit. We liked our independence out here. Once you have to deal with the government, it was going to be a different place to live in. And we knew that cattle and, and, and uh, uh, people don't mix. Once we explained to the Board of Supervisors exactly what the Park Service is doing, they, they, didn't, they didn't have a chance. Kennedy was elected president in 1960, that things began to move in, in 61. After he appointed me Secretary of Interior, he sent an annual conservation message, and it included making Cape Cod a national seashore. We looked at the president's proposal, and then we said, no, it would be selfish to just make Cape Cod a national seashore. Let's have one on each coast. And we proposed Padre Island, Texas, a 100 mile long barrier island, and Point Reyes. I saw an opportunity and I wanted to arouse interest. One of the lucky things that happened is that whenever a delegation from Congress would come out here to take a look at the peninsula, the weather would be gorgeous, absolutely beautiful, like today. The fogs, the bad weather that uh, frequently happens out here just wasn't here. out here, we wanted the foggy, windy old day out here where they couldn't stand outside and have to sit in a car, but it didn't happen. Well, they saw this and said, oh man, this has got to be a park. <laughs> yep, that's the way it went. My 
department developed a plan to acquire the dairy farms and the cost was huge. The original cost of acquiring the Point Reyes land was $14 million. That $14 million was a lot of money in the 1960s. And Clem Miller came to me and said, we've got a big problem out of Point Reyes. The big problem was that acquiring the ranches for the park had pushed the anticipated cost of the National Seashore from $14 million to 25 million and counting, and Congress was balking. So the Park Service developed an unusual plan. The ranches would be in the park, yet would stay in private hands as long as farming continued. The outcome of that was the creation of what was called the pastoral zone, where the ranchers could remain. We had a good connection in the, in the Senate, Boyd Stewart, who was another rancher, started to work with us. And he was really friendly with uh, Senator Marble from Nevada. He was in the Senate Interior Committee, so all of those things helped us to be treated fairly and get a workable solution to the park acquisition. And with that, Clem proved the bill had local support, and Congressman Aspinall gave it a green light. The Democrats uh, were the majority in both houses of Congress, but uh, the Republicans had a vote also. So it was important that we get some Republican support. I knew the ranking Republican member of the House Interior Committee. His name was John Saylor, very conservative and a great supporter of conservation causes. When it came to the vote, whoever was chairing the House called for the yeas and nays. It was close enough for some concern, so John Saylor stood up at the Republican table and went like this, as a, just a, uh, the umpire, saying that the, the runner is home safe and the deed was done. John Kennedy signed the bill, at which point it became law, and Clem, being the junior president, was in the back row, and uh, Claire Engel, Senator from California, was in the front row. And Claire looked around for Clem and saw him. He said, Clem, you belong here. He almost picked him up by his elbows and changed places with him. So that's what's in the picture. And before Engel and Clem left the uh, Oval Office, they got a commitment from the president to make the initial $2 million available to buy the land. That $2 million broke a decades-old national policy, endorsed by Speaker of the House Joe Cannon, who famously said, Not a cent for scenery. If somebody wants to give property, that's fine. But we're not going to spend taxpayers' money. That was his policy. And we broke that policy when we passed the first national seashore bills because those were federal money spent to acquire private land. Less than a month after the president signed the bill, Clem was killed in an airplane accident in, uh, in Humboldt County. There was a memorial service for Clem over where the uh, visitor center is. Clem was buried out here on a little point overlooking all of Drake's Bay. The Park Service has a prohibition in law, actually, that there will be no burials on a uh, national park system land. However, the land had not just been acquired by the Park Service. The owners of the ranch gave the United States the, uh, the first land to begin the National Seashore for Clem's gravesite.
He turned out to be a natural in the house. He would have done great things. Other great things. questions but I just wanted to tell you first about there were two quite famous people in that first section um, one of them is um, Stuart Udall which a lot of you probably remember and um, and um, Bill Duddleson who was Clem's sort of right-hand man um, he knew that I wanted to ask Stuart Udall to be in the film so he called him and got permission from him for me to call. And then Bill called me and said, when you speak to him, address him as Mr. Udall, not Stuart. So I call and I do the right thing and tell him that I want to bring my crew to Santa Fe where he lived. And he says, no. And I was just like, all right, this Mr. Udall thing is. <laughs> done with this formality and I just said I use Mr. Udall I just said Mr. Udall no it doesn't work for me and, and he said all right send me some things and and then it turned out that the reason he said no is because he didn't think he was worth my spending the money to bring my crew to New Mexico but he has a, a son in Berkeley and when he was coming um, to visit the son he agreed to give us a day to film him, much to his son's dismay. He actually didn't tell his family that he was <laughs> involved with the shoot during Thanksgiving. So. And, and Mr. Udall is like tall, right? And, and pretty big. And so the son calls me and says, my father's kind of frail, so I want you to be responsible for him not falling. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> The other famous person who's, who's in the film is Frances McDormand, the Academy Award winning, two time Academy Award winning actress. And we knew we were gonna use narration and we knew that so many of the rebels um, from that time were men, and no offense, Doug, <laughs> and that we wanted to sort of balance it out with a female voice and the person that we thought was right was Frances McDormand. And of course, we didn't know Frances McDormand, we didn't know anyone who knew her, but, and really, we had already been invited to premiere the film at the Mill Valley Film Festival. We still hadn't gotten an introduction to Frances McDormand, and then it turned out she lives part-time in Bolinas. <laughs> and we had no other um, backup choice, so it was her or nobody, or me, or Nancy. <laughs> so someone who frequently socialized with her um, carried handwritten notes and um, from me and um, DVD samples of the work in progress, and this went on like three times, and still, you know, it's like the Mill Valley Film Festival is coming. And, um, and all of a sudden, one day, I got a call and was like, Hi, it's Fran. I'll do it. <laughs> and of course we thought, this is glorious. We can just drive her to San Francisco to a recording booth, get the darn thing done, carry Or to Skywalker. Or to Skywalker, which is very close in Marin County. And of course, she said, I won't be in Marin. You have to come to New York City. <laughs> so we planned a one-day drop into New York City in a recording studio, record her, get on the plane that same day, come back, cut her voice in, get the darn thing ready <laughs> for the Mill Valley Film Festival. We were uh, one, we completed this version one day before the premiere. So we're sweating it. You had a question back there. Yeah, I wondered uh, who are the owners of the land that, that sold it for 14 million, 
And uh, how was the $14 million value arrived at? I don't know the answer to either one of those questions. Well, Doug, do you know? There were many parcels of, of land, mm -hmm. so there were many ranchers. Mm -hmm. Gulf Oil. Oh, well, actually, Gulf Oil did own all the headlands, which was our next chapter. <laughs> Wait, yeah, you wanted to know. Private ranchers for the most part. These were mostly private ranchers, and as you um, travel up the Point Range National Seashore, you'll see these signs that say Historic Ranch H. And yeah. it went from A to H, H or G, yeah. something like that. So, another question? Well, we would like to uh, show the next chapter. Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, it regards uh, the headlands of uh, Marin County, which is right across the Golden Gate Bridge. And um, there was this city that was to be proposed and built there. So, we. Um, we're very fascinated to um, uh, explore this, and we'll tell you more after we show you the, uh, the clip. Here we go. But um, this oh. was per Scott's special request that we show this particular chapter. Yes. thing to do. If you can politic it once, heck, you can do it again. After World War II, to accommodate 1.4 million new families that formed every year, developers built new housing at a furious rate, and big corporations surged into the land development business. Gulf Oil bought the Marincello land and became Thomas Frugia's partner. Marin Shello was to be a self-contained community where people would live, go to school, work, play, and that they would rarely leave. Mr. Fruge considered us, I think, so many hayseeds, and he was working board of supervisors very successfully. The politics were growth is not only inevitable, it's good. More uh, commercial activity, more sales tax activity, growth is good. There was no such thing as an environmental movement. And the few who thought, gee, it'd be too bad to see this develop, had no role models. Nobody had ever pro shown them the power of a few persons to change events. Well, you know, there were a few people who figured out that a town two miles out from the Golden Gate, that the people were probably
probably going to be wanting to come into San Francisco fairly often, and that this was ridiculous, and might lead to as many as 16 lanes to get them into San Francisco. And so the people in Marin began to fight it. In an unusual, if not unprecedented move, the Marin County Board of Supervisors agreed to hold a sort of town meeting to allow the Gulf Oil Company to explain its immediate plans and meet the opposition. We hope during these next three months to consider every alternative, and in making our recommendation to Gulf, uh, all of these alternatives uh, uh, be considered. Do you know that those Golden Gate headlines are featured in a book by the Sierra Club as one of the wonders of the world? They're not meant for a high-rise tower such as we saw, or for libraries or tennis courts. Therefore, this generation, the next generation, not just of Marin County in California, but of the entire world, there's only one view like that. And you should knock off this nonsense at once. More and more frustration and anger grew in some of the ranks, and uh, that started the movement as I knew it. Sisters, they must have been in their 80s with tin cans and petitions blocking traffic on the Golden Gate Bridge, signing a petition saying, you know, we don't want Marincello, etc., and getting gifts of money. After the ladies successfully had gathered well enough signatures to have a referendum on the ballot, the Board of Supervisors instructed the county clerk to get rid of that, and he was well instructed. He found technical irregularities in some of the signatures. Strangely, just enough of the signatures to get rid of the referendum altogether. Huey Johnson persuaded lawyers Doug Ferguson, Robert Pretzel, and Martin Rosen to volunteer to file two lawsuits. One was known as the People's Lawsuit. It would wind up before the California Supreme Court. All we really wanted was the right for the people to decide the fate of this land. Four to three, we lost. Thank God for Mr. Pretzel. Another lawsuit had been filed. This litigation went on for years. Nonetheless, because there was no restraining order, the project had begun. They had moved bulldozers onto the property. They had constructed some initial improvements on the property, as they would term it. Meanwhile, on behalf of the Nature Conservancy, Huey Johnson traveled frequently to the Gulf Oil headquarters in Pittsburgh to negotiate. It was classic Huey when he was talking to Gulf back in Washington. And he mentioned as one of the reasons they should deal with him is that this litigation was going to drag on for years. And the Gulf lawyers laughed and said, you know, those guys are going to run out of money. We're not worried about them. And he said, there's something you don't understand. They're unpaid and they're crazy. <laughs> they will go the distance. But if any one person would get the most credit, I would give it to this fellow Bob Pretzel, who gave it a thousand hours of his time over five years, you know, just refusing to concede and refusing to compromise and checking on the legal status of things every step of the way. The law at that time said you had to give 10 days uh, publication in the paper so that interested people could appear and object if they wanted to. Well, they only gave seven. So we claim that they did not follow the zoning laws. And they did this on not only one occasion, but on 10. And in the end, the development lost in court and uh, that was the end of it. Finally, the last time I went back, the vice president of real estate was not there and a new face was there. He said, everybody leave the room. Not you, Johnson. And everybody left the room. He said, all right, you SOB, you win. What do I do? I said, I win what? He said, you can buy Baranchello property. We decided to withdraw from the proposal. You know, he was so, so exasperated. You know, he just kind of snarling at me. And we talked about the terms briefly. <laughs> and I said, I've got to give you some money to, uh, to 
make the deal real. I didn't have much money to bank, like most environmentalists, and I gave him a check for $100, and he signed the thing, and uh, it was a lucky break. That was the last time I ever heard from Gulf Oil. Conservancy, a private volunteer conservation organization, is officially acquiring this 2,100-acre parcel to put the cap on our efforts on Red Headlands Park acquisition. And it means that when enough people care enough and work hard enough, long enough, that the right thing will, in time, happen despite what uh, would appear to be permanent setbacks. This day marks the realization of a conservationist dream of many years. The Baroncello property, 2,100 acres on the Golden Gate headlands, has been purchased by Nature Conservancy and will be held in trust until the federal government takes over for the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. notice about your <laughs> fame. <laughs> so, as I said, this is the person with the funniest line in the whole film. <laughs> they're unpaid and they're crazy. And I have a special role. I don't take no for an answer, and I know the power of people doing things who would not take no for an answer. But Nancy and Kenji said they would, they made a number of brilliant documentaries and lost money on each one <laughs> because they work very hard. Nobody's buying documentaries very much. They go to see them, but they don't buy them. They don't pay admission. So when they told me they were going to have a chance to make a film about the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, they said, would you be interested in helping? I said, oh, gee, that sounds like a really compelling subject. <laughs> uh, I'll have to get back to you. I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now, you, you know us. You know our work. And I said, Here's what I know about you. You make the best documentaries in the world, and you know how to make them. And Thank usually you. you just say, well, this is a thing about the seashore. This time, tell them what you're going to make. This is a movie about people changing history. And said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's what we in the film business call a hook. <laughs> that, and once that hook is set, people will come to that film. And I can tell you that we went to that brief little discussion, this film being seen more than almost any documentary in the conservation world. And in addition, raising some money. Yes. 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 <laughs> and, and it's true that, um, that this, because of that hook that, that Doug suggested, we focused on the dramatic parts, which really had to do with the politics behind saving that land, you know? It, and I mean, every single, there are six stories of saving land in, in the film, and every single one of them is about politics, you know? Um, so. I, think, I think it was you who shared with me that uh, the core of any movement is that there's always money involved, but there's people, and it's really many against money and the many will win eventually. I, I really took that as a, a guiding philosophy for what we're doing with this film. As questions? Any questions? Sorry. Actually, I want to I wanna start with a couple questions. You mentioned money, and the first one relates to money. Uh, Gulf Oil sold the headlands, apparently, according to the film, for $100. Do uh, you think there's any chance I could get it for $200 now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Doug, he, it, that $100 wasn't the full amount. You have to have consideration. Consideration. Judge this call. Right. Okay. The real question, though, was um, this series of events in Marincello in particular happened during 
a very early phase of what we think of now as the conservation movement or the environmental movement nationally. And as the film uh, demonstrates, this was pretty much a cutting edge event that the development process, the, the powers of real estate development were essentially stopped in their tracks by a grassroots environmental movement. Uh, maybe the first time that really ever happened on this scale nationally. Now, you know, decades later, we have a very established environmental infrastructure, if you will, in the form of organizations nationally and internationally for conservation and environmental protection. But do you see, here's the question, do you see that there are any threats currently or in the future to the protection of these areas that have been thus far protected? Are there, are there plans in store that we need to be aware of that this could happen again, that someone would come forward with some kind of a proposal that we need to be aware of? The best thing that can happen to something like this piece of land is to have people get excited and to save it. Then, if you want to do something else with that land, you have to persuade them or fight them and they will fight like a snake, like a rattlesnake, because they made it happen. And they don't want to have somebody else ruin their parade. However, I, I read the papers, and I'm sure a lot of you do, and there have been um, you know, um, attempts by the federal government that owns public land, um, particularly in the West, to um, sell them, open up parts of them for um, drilling for oil and other um, resources like Bears Ears, the Arctic National yes. Refuge. Um, I mean, I, it, those are the two that I'm most aware of because they've been in the papers, but I, when I've spoken with people who work for the National Park Service, this is going on all over the country, right? And so I, it seems like the, the battles never end and, um, you know, any, any particular Marin focus, as far as you know? Not that I know of. That, no, uh, Marin is kind of sacred land to the people who fought these fights. But what is amazing to me is that how many people are saying, yeah, but that was then, it's now. If, if our leader, nameless, <laughs> wants to take back the, all the victories that have been won, it's not our business. He's good for the stock market, let's go. And that is the sorrow of this decade. So many people worked so hard to create a lot of protection for health and the environment, etc. And the attitude of people who should be standing up and saying, no, 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 wait a minute. It's just, I've only lived in Marin two and a half years or so, so I don't know, I went around this great history. But I understand there was an attempt to take, before 101 was built or something like this, with Marty Griffin to, to oppose running it through Fairfax and I guess out through Nicasio and then on up the coast with great ideas of similar development opportunities. Um, when did that happen? And uh, how is it related to uh, stopping Monticello? It was the 1960s, and as Marty Rosen said, progress was good. People thought progress was good, and the, it, the conservation movement had to deal with that fact. Progress is good. What are you doing? This is progress. This, we need an eight-lane highway going from San Francisco out to this park you're talking about. And if the park's in the way, forget it. That, that was the attitude we were coping with. We had to wake people up one by one by one to what was going to happen. And that's why things like this film still have a very, very substantial role to play in what happens in the future. That topic is actually covered in, in one of our chapters uh, because when Point Reyes National Seashore was established, uh, Bolinas, which is the town that's south of the boundaries of the National Park was declared sort of the gateway to the park. Mm -hmm. And there was much interest in developing Bolinas and Bolinas Bay and a freeway infrastructure that would feed into that and other cities nearby. So that, that is, we, we touch on that. So it's part of the whole chapter 
this contiguous park and parkland and open space and, and such that stretches from San Francisco to Tipa Point Race. And my understanding is that um, the Nicasio Reservoir was built to um, hold water for all the houses and things that were going to be built out there because of that beautiful road that was going to go from San Rafael to Point Reyes Station. So, you yes, have a um, the, the, I live in Nicasio above the reservoir, <laughs> and the people that owned the property first had to give up a lot of their land for that reservoir. Um, so, the Garzolis. <laughs> anyway, my point, what I'd like to bring up is that with all this expansion, there were farms, ranches, that were allowed to continue and continue to this day. And what I, I grew up in a farming community. So I, my heart feels for the people that are trying to continue the dairy business and the cattle business. And they're trying to do it organically. They're doing it well. And it bothers me a lot to see people say, well, we own that, so therefore, we should have bicycles go through it, we should have this go through it, that go through it. I can't go along with that because these are the same owners from 100 years ago that have this land. They're renting it, they're leasing it, but they're still providing for it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm a lawyer. I love making deals. And when a deal is made, you ought to stick with it. And if you don't stick with it, leave the room. That's what I feel about the people who are now saying, oh, well, let's just uh, let's take, get rid of the elk and do this and do that. They weren't there. They didn't make the deal that is the Golden Gate National Recreation Center. It is a fascinating, fascinating story, the creation of this park. That's why it said, make this movie or die. <laughs> but one of the things that is so unique about the Point Reyes National Seashore is that it has bars within its, its borders. And a lot of national parks um, that were created, the agricultural people um, had to sell and get out. And I was always struck by what I know about the Bay Area as being like the home of this um, foodie culture and locally grown food. And those ranches and farms are part of that. And there's a certain sort of tipping point of if there's too few farmers and ranchers, then none of them can survive. So you had a question. Mm -hmm. or, or comment, I, I just wanna say, um, very inspired by, I've seen it before, the, the whole thing. But I live in Marine City, and I live in Golden Gate Village, which is the public housing that is that has a trailhead that's right to the park, through the park. So there's no place in the United States where you have a place for poor and very low income people that have that type of access to the point now where the powers that be want to take it from the poor. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, this just gives me more fire on the inside to continue to fight against um, or to stand in the gap against anything happening to uh, Marin City, which was uh, designated uh, after the war and during those, those 50s for black people that had no place to go within this county. And now for the next generation, generations that want to come and people coming in, see this property, vast real estate and want to have it. So I'm just glad, that's why I decided I would, I'm a member, but I wanted to come and see and hear, uh, you know, to just reignite that fire uh, because our board of supervisors made a decision yesterday that they're going to have to be made to take back. And so just in seeing this, it uh, really shows what can be done um, to preserve the beauty and history of part of Marin County. Thank you. What, I think, is there a, um, some sort of issue with trying to take that trailhead away? Um, not the, trailhead, the, the issue is that the county wants to um, make mix in some housing out of Golden Gate Village, okay. which would cause uh, you know displacement 
of the protected class out of the out of this county. And Golden Gate Village or the public housing is on the national register as a historic district. And so my within me, I wonder and it was all done at the same time as the Civic Marine Civic Center. So, you know, the Civic Center has outgrown the county has outgrown the Civic Center, but God forbid if anybody talked about tearing it down and making something bigger. And so why do you want to do the same thing for the poor? Because it was all democracy, people in place. And so, uh, you know, in it to win it. And I, like in the movie, I have nothing else to do but time also uh, to just make sure that it doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. God bless your effort, and God bless you talking to everybody you know in Marin City about the necessity to speak up. That's right. Thank you. Is, is there any relevance here to, to the story of Vera Schultz? I, 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 her role, I thought that was something worth thinking about. We decided not to make a miniseries, which this could have been, <laughs> and, um, and lack of funds. And um, uh, as you can see in just this uh, short sample, there are a lot of archival footage, which we had to acquire and pay for to the various owners of, of archival footage. And we went through over 1,500 videos, photographs, images, articles, and um, we, are, we had to honor and we wanted to honor, but yes, there, there there are many, many, many more stories, and we just had to make sure that it was a at a broadcast length. <laughs> On a superficial level, observing it in living in Mill Valley, which and seeing the status she had in the county in this field, and then that her husband was a realtor in Marin City was quite something. I I just stressed out so much when we were making the film over those 10 years about who was going to be left out because there were there were so many compelling stories that um just like Kenji said it wasn't going to be a mini series so um and she was certainly one of them that I read about it was so compelling so um <laughs> if you want to make a movie <laughs> there's your subject any other questions oh yes. I'll bring the mic over Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, was this a full-time effort uh, of yours over the 10 years? And number two, uh, could you each uh, tell us uh, about your backgrounds, uh, where you grew up, and uh, where you were living when you were asked or to consider this documentary? Should I start? Um, I grew up in Concord, California. Just he wanted to know about whether we were working full time on this. On this full, full time? Not exactly full time, but a lot of our time. We have, we were completing yet another documentary at the same time, and trying to make a living. And um, uh, as documentarians, uh, we can't pay ourselves enough for our time. It, it it is true to work a love, but it's 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 a matter of something that you believe in. Um, you wake up one morning and it's like, you know, I should, I should work on this and not accept that job that pays better. And um, so it, it, it was full-time, part-time. <laughs> we, we've worked many weekends. We would go into our home office and we would have postcards covering an entire wall of how the story would be playing and we would move things around, and it would be a Saturday night, and a Sunday night, and a Monday morning, and a Tuesday night. So it, it, the hours are countless. I just can't answer that. <laughs> We're not a lot of fun, according to our friends. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so. Oh, and, and in regards to background, I grew up in Concord, California, which is in the East Bay. Uh, my parents were interned during World War II. My father was a farmer and then became a gardener. I grew up around agriculture. Um, we lived on a three-acre farm. I learned how to drive on a tractor before a car. Um, there are cattle across the street. There are horses. So 
I'm, I'm very much connected to agriculture and outdoors. And as a young man, worked for my father as a gardener's son, and uh, until I left, until I left home and went to the big city of San Francisco. <laughs> but finally, uh, moved to Mill Valley. Met, well, you went to the Art Institute. I went to the San Francisco Art Institute, and I wanted to be a painter. Decided about one week into painting <laughs> that I was not a painter, and uh, uh, learned uh, still photography, sculpture, other art art disciplines, and. Uh, came out of it uh, learning uh, experimental filmmaking. But as far as editing, I taught myself by observing all the materials that I would capture and what story is contained within it. And I love editing because there's a story in this limited amount of information, and sometimes it's a lot of information, so that has become my love, is to tell a story with the material that you have that's affecting people, that people are happy and sad and they struggle and they have a goal. So that's my background. And um, I, I haven't forgotten that you had a question. So I um, am from North Adams, Massachusetts. Do any of you know North Adams? You do, you do? How? <laughs> Okay. I had a roommate from North Adams. Oh my God. So it, North Adams is way out in Western Massachusetts. It's a factory town. There's a string of three factory towns up there. When you go to Tanglewood and to the Norman Rockwell Museum, you don't have any awareness of North Adams. But um, there was all these factories, all my family worked in those factories and in the late 60s, they started closing down the factories, and um, my father's department was one of the first to close down, so he was an engineer, so we could move. We were mobile, but all my relatives, my godparents, everybody um, was left there, you know, and, and the city had 50% um, unemployment all of a sudden, and um, the place just went to the dogs. <laughs> and um, so, but I, was lucky I went to college and, um, and I studied public health education. My very first job out of college was to make five short dramatic films um, to teach college students how to drink responsibly. And this was at the University of Massachusetts, the party school. <laughs> I didn't know about filmmaking and I didn't know about drinking because I couldn't afford to drink in college. But I totally fell in love with filmmaking because it involved like everything I was interested in. It was physical, it had all these technical things, and, um, and I didn't realize it, but it was also artistic, and I didn't have any idea that I was interested in the arts, but it turned out it was undeniable. So when my best friend um, from Massachusetts called me and said, hey Nance, I'm on a ranch, and the cattle gallop over rocks as big as footballs, and I'm thinking of making a film, I quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> my parents were insanely worried, and I went out there, and um, and um, we made our second film. I also had to learn to ride a horse. I had never ridden a horse before. So over three years' time, we edited, uh, we shot that film, and then I moved to San Francisco to edit it, and someone said, you need an editor. Here's three names. One of them was Kenji, <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one more question, Doris. I congratulate you that your, the filming is, is really beautiful and is an art, and also with a wonderful message of local control, that people can make a difference. We're not out of the woods yet. We're in the midst of local control being taken over for <clears throat> housing next to uh, transit, uh, it's, it's, it's a way of overcoming local control so that we don't have another, uh, another uh, mammoth development here. So, the game isn't over. <laughs> and I By congratulate no you on step one, but please keep on with your fight. Thank you.
if I may, I'd like to take the privilege of answering a question you haven't yet asked me, but <coughs> which is, what is your background for this? My background was zero, zero. I was born in Berkeley, and I was going to go to law school and be a lot of money to what people do. And then I found out there are better things to do with your time. And when I was a Boy Scout, a Boy Scout, 13 years old, my leader said, I don't know anything about preaching. But some parents said we ought to have a Sunday morning church service. So I'm gonna to try to put together a church service. He said, okay, how many guys wanna go up there? There's like five of us. And so we wa walked up to a beautiful peak, looked out at the high Sierra. He said, uh, I I'm gonna reserve my speech, my, my sermon, until you've looked around for two minutes. So we all looked around the high Sierra. He said, okay, here's the sermon. Did you like what you see? And all of us were visibly Moved. And he said, then what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was right. Well, on that note, we've run out of time. I, I, I just got to say, I, I had high hopes for this program. I was very inspired. And fortunately, our, our, our board uh, acquiesced to bring this program to everyone's attention today. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we did it. Equally thrilled that we had. Uh, Kenji and Nancy to join us, as well as Doug as a surprise special guest. I want to thank all of them for coming today. And I, I, I hope you enjoy the program as well for, for a holiday kind of spirit end of the year program. I think this was about as good as you get in terms of a, of, of a feel good topic. So let's all sing Kubaya. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> but, uh, on your way out, feel free to, to chat with our uh, speakers. Feel free to pick up a copy or several of the DVD, which will be for sale at the table. And uh, I wish you all a happy holiday. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you in 2019. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.